Assalamu alaikum. Peace be with you. Peace and blessings to the class of 2020. Shalom Aleichem. Peace unto you. Friends, the divine offers peace that passes understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God now and forever. Amen. Om Shanti 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 Hello, class of 2020. We have missed you profoundly. Wherever you are, we are so happy to celebrate this weekend with you and to welcome you and your families to the virtual 2020 Multi-Faith Baccalaureate Service of Dartmouth College. Although we wish we were together inside the beauty of Rollins Chapel, we are grateful for this opportunity to create a spiritual community of connection across the globe with student speakers, the voices of our beloved Dartmouth College Gospel Choir, and an address by esteemed alum, Dr. Michael Minna. In this moment, we cannot help but feel mixed emotions about the loss of time, experience, and for some, the people they love. But we also cannot help but feel so proud of you as we joyfully mark the conclusion of your Dartmouth academic journey. In letters to a young poet, Rainer Maria Rilke wrote, be patient toward all that is unsolved in your heart and try to love the questions themselves like locked rooms and like books that are now written in a very foreign tongue. Do not now seek the answers which cannot be given you because you would not be able to live them. And the point is to live everything. Live the questions now. Perhaps you will then gradually, without noticing it, live along some distant day into the answer. These past months of the pandemic have been a time of many questions and challenges. And yet this spring has been a season for the class of 2020 to demonstrate how in the midst of life's unanticipated quandaries, they could intensify their courage and face the unknown with wisdom, creativity, faith, and love. Today, in continuing the legacy of the historical baccalaureate service, our student speakers will draw on sacred texts, each from his or her own tradition or beliefs, to teach and reflect on the ways their years at Dartmouth have insistently prompted them to live their questions and tenaciously search for meaningful answers. In creating together this shared holy space and time, we recognize our varied spiritual and faith identities, and we offer our deepest honor and respect to the Abenaki people and all Native people who represent the foundations and commitments for the education of the mind, the heart, and the spirit that became the Dartmouth we know today. Holding in our hearts those whose lives have ended in years past or tragically in recent days, while also rejoicing in reaching this precious time, we acknowledge the mystery of life. Holy One, may our graduating students continue to live their questions with patience and persistence. And may we who celebrate their inspirational pursuit of purpose and extraordinary achievements offer our blessings and prayers that in the years ahead they will find the answers they seek to build and sustain a world of generosity, of justice, well-being, and peace. We continue with the reflections of our first student speaker, Sunpreet Singh. Satgur ki seva gaakri, sir dije ap gaavare, sabd mile ta har mile, 
seva paave sab khaye it is very difficult to serve the true guru surrender your head give up your selfishness realizing the shabad one meets with the lord and all one service is accepted from the shri guru granth sahib the holy scripture of my faith sikhism selfless service is a key principle of sikhism i was raised by the idea that serving others should always be a consistent and significant presence in my life in my time at dartmouth i like many of my low income first gen student peers have faced difficult transitions i had to learn how to balance multiple important commitments from working to support my family to academics to my own health and wellness and serving my community now with the covid-19 pandemic and the uncertainty that has come with it selfless service has become an even more important but also more complicated part of my life in the middle of finals i was asked to leave campus and figure out housing food and wifi plans all on my own while taking care of my family back home in all honesty it was really hard for me to discern what to do i had to take care of my family and make sure that we had enough money for food and rent and that took precedence but i also wanted to help my communities and i really felt so lost because leaving home to volunteer was a threat of spreading the virus to others including my own vulnerable family members like my father who has diabetes and kidney disease if i spread the virus to him even with the intention of helping others i wouldn't be able to figure it myself but in the process i also realized a fundamental truth that we can't do everything or help everyone at least not all at once rather it's a matter of waiting for our time and being ready for it when it comes to me selfless service is about doing what we can while balancing all the other important commitments we have in life people self care in our communities as my tradition teaches all of one service is accepted whether someone chooses to work in a well paying job post grad like i have to provide for my parents and myself or they are working at a nonprofit helping people's lives directly every day it doesn't really matter what matters is that selfless service remains an important value in all of our lives leaving dartmouth i realize that there's still so much that we don't know and have yet to learn for grounded in selfless service and realizing what really matters in life family community health and wellness together i know and believe we can serve our community selflessly while working to build a more just kind and caring society thank you Should I
I'd like to share a story from the book of Ruth. It's about a friendship between Naomi and Ruth. Naomi tells Ruth to leave her and make the best of her life without the burden of Naomi. But Ruth replies, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. Whenever I hear this text, I feel a sense of wonder. My heart speeds up at the thought of a friendship so strong that only death would end it. But then I look at my life, and I feel disappointed, maybe even ashamed, that I can't point to a friendship like this. So why has this text echoed in my head for the last six years? Why do I sing it to myself when I'm walking home or cooking or coming to meetings? I think I'm drawn to it precisely because I struggle to find a lifelong friendship. I had a golden friendship with two housemates sophomore year. Freshly baked bread, crackling fires, conversations until two in the morning, abiding compassion through loss and grief, three women coming into our own. That was the friendship that taught me how to hold another person's heart without gripping. Those months built the most rugged self-esteem I had ever had. I rest on that foundation still. But even that friendship, golden as it was, doesn't fit Ruth's mold. We're scattered in different states now. We share late nights and fresh bread with different people. And that's as it should be. I don't think all our friendships can be modeled after Naomi and Ruth's. Ruth's passage has come to take on a spiritual meaning for me. It challenges me to acknowledge what does endure from one friendship to the next. Our new friendships benefit from what we learned in our old ones. I'm still learning to trust that new friendships will emerge. For me, this trust is an act of faith. Faith that God will continue to show up in the form of friends I can count on. As I move forward from college, I draw strength from hearing Ruth speak the words of God. Where you go, I will go. Fourteen months ago, I was diagnosed with obsessive compulsive disorder, something I've been suffering with for 21 years. I find it hard to talk about uncertainty because as a person biologically destined to be neurotic, I've never known anything else. To me, uncertainty is better described as ambiguity. In every moment, I simultaneously feel everything that could go wrong. Yet in every anxiety attack, I see a thousand sparks of truth. Ambiguity teaches me that the grittiest knowledge takes the form of questions, not answers, which is also firmly grounded in the teachings and traditions that inform my Jewish identity. In the section Bruchus, chapter 58a, the Talmud reads, one who sees multitudes of Israel recites, blessed are you, Adonai, our God, ruler of the universe, who knows all secrets. Why is this? God sees a whole nation whose minds are unlike each other and whose faces are unlike each other. And God, who knows all secrets, knows what is in each of their hearts, end quote. Judaism, at its core, expresses that ambiguity is perpetual, a multiplicity of voices in a multiplicity of lands. At and beyond Dartmouth, I've been prescribed a sense of unity that I've never genuinely felt. How can we be one community? We span vast differences in politics and culture. Our minds and our faces are unlike each other. We cannot know oneness, so we can only pray to God's secret of oneness. At best, all we can understand is the mess and hazard of the finite world that we live in. A third of my great-grandparents held from Lithuania, where there was a diverse experience of Judaism, expressed through socialist philosophy, music, and language. There is a Yiddish term they used called doikite, which means hearness. Doikite, hearness, not thereness, speaks to my understanding of my Jewish identity, my anxiety, my studies, and my mode of prayer. Doikite describes not uncertainty, but the tangible presence of ambiguity. I study the brain because all minds, like all faces, are unlike each other. I study language because in one word, there are a thousand meanings. 
I play klezmer because music demands that I express my visceral self. Having OCD, I don't have the leisure of existing in the world without rugged intentionality and a relentless feeling of hereness. I'm constantly reminded that I'm in the state of ambiguity. Living in our disjointed world, leaving Dartmouth, not knowing what is next in my life, all I can say is, blessed are you, Adonai our God, ruler of the universe, who knows all secrets. I'm Catherine Lively, professor of sociology and dean of the college. Each year during this very special service, we recognize and honor families of students who passed away during their time at Dartmouth. Sadly, we lost Kyle Janicek, Geisel class of 2020, in October of 2018. We welcome Kyle's family to our gathering today and honor his memory. We also embrace all of you who've experienced loss this year. We grieve with you for the loss of your daughters, sons, parents, grandparents, partners, extended family members, and friends. Graduates and families, we know their spirit is here with you this weekend. Please join me in a moment of silence for Kyle and all of those who would otherwise be with us today. This weekend is a turning point for all, and it comes during a pivotal period of extraordinary change and upheaval. As we anticipate the opportunities and challenges that lie ahead, we are incredibly fortunate that Dr. Michael Mina, Dartmouth class of 2006, is with us. Just 14 years ago, Michael finished his Dartmouth undergraduate career as a senior fellow, one of a few selected by our faculty to pursue a full year senior project for which the intellectual scope and breadth of imagination goes far beyond that which can be accomplished by taking courses within the existing curriculum and academic major minor framework. During his final year, Michael focused on biochemical engineering, microbiology, and public health research. This tome was the result, an incredible work of interdisciplinary scholarship that lives in Rahner Special Collections and is dedicated to members of the Kurinda Tsunami Refugee Camp who welcomed him into their lives after the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami that destroyed much of the Sri Lankan coastline. He was there during the crisis in that part of the world and is working to respond to the pandemic crisis of today. With his Dartmouth AB in hand, Michael's extraordinary career trajectory included earning both his medical and doctoral degrees from Emory University and postdoctoral fellowships at Princeton and Harvard Medical School. This past October, which seems so long ago now, Michael received the Early Independence Award from the director of the National Institutes of Health. The five-year award supports exceptionally creative young scientists with high impact ideas, selected for their ability to think outside of the box and their potential to accelerate the pace of biomedical, behavioral, and social science discoveries. His interdisciplinary research on infectious diseases and vaccines unites biology and laboratory research, epidemiology and mathematical modeling, medicine, and immunology. As an epidemiologist at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health, his collaborative work is based at the Center for Communicable Disease Dynamics in the Department of Immunology and Infectious Diseases. He also serves as a physician and an Associate Medical Director of Clinical Microbiology at Brigham and Women's Hospital. In the summer of 2017, The Economist magazine featured eight case studies of progress makers in strategy and leadership. Michael was one of those identified as being among a new breed of change agent. 
who bring to their jobs a heightened global awareness, unprecedented digital empowerment, and an innate motivation to do meaningful work with significant impact. But before I turn this virtual podium over to him as our featured speaker, let me tell you a little more about who he is. He loves rowing, running, and rock climbing, pottery, charcoal drawing, and origami, and comes from a close family of five kids, including a twin. He is also an ordained Buddhist monk. As a member of the Dartmouth community who exemplifies the best of what a liberal arts education has to offer, I can't wait to hear what he has to share with us today. Please welcome Dr. Michael Mina. To the Dartmouth class of 2020, to your friends and family, and to the wider Dartmouth community, it's an honor to be here. I'm going to be very honest with you. I cannot imagine what it feels like to be finishing out your Dartmouth careers away from campus and in a time of social distancing. To be unable to give your best friends a hug on such a special weekend as this, nor your extended families a hug on such a special weekend as this. I presume that for many of you, this is not easy. I do hope that at your 10th reunion, or maybe your first, you find a way to have a second commencement ceremony properly on the green. It goes without saying that today is a time of great uncertainty. For the world and more locally for each of you, and your plans for the weeks, months, and years ahead. For many of you going off to graduate schools, you likely will matriculate into your new programs, but many of you may meet your new classmates over a conference call. For those of you going into industry, consulting, or the like, the outlook may be even more uncertain. For some of you, your entry into your first full-time job may be placed on hold because of the downturn in the economy from this virus. Even if your plans are moving forward unabated, I have no doubt that these are difficult times to be taking your first steps as a college graduate. The coronavirus has touched all of our lives, but amidst the global devastation it has created and the physical distancing it has forced upon us, it has done something else too. The virus is bringing people together. It's causing a common problem that the world must fix together, and it has caused a common dialogue to rally around. This is a rare event to have a true common enemy of the people. Certainly not in my lifetime have I been witness to a global event with such profound effects on civilization and the environment. In Northern India, towns north of Delhi reported that for the first time in recent memory, they could see the Himalayas rising along the horizon. For years, the thick pollution had covered that magical site. Now reduced car travel stemming from social distancing has provided a reprieve from the usual smog. Closer to home, at least for most of us, flights, traffic congestion, and car accidents have plummeted. And ironically for many, familial social interactions have increased, though through a window all too reminiscent of the Brady Bunch. You all are leaving Dartmouth in an incredible time. Most classes leave Dartmouth and become yet another great class to go out and change the world. For Dartmouth, I suspect the memory of your class will be etched in stone. The story of graduating at this moment will echo onwards, and I suspect it will serve to bring you closer together and closer to the college in the years to come. Having something to rally behind, having something so profoundly disappointing as having to have left college campus as you near the end of your Dartmouth journey, that disappointment can turn into and build strength. When many people undergo the same plights together, they tend to come out stronger. When I graduated from Dartmouth, Elie Wiesel was our commencement speaker. He's no longer with us, and if you haven't read the book Night, I certainly suggest that you do. Wiesel is an amazing individual. He lived through the Holocaust in Auschwitz, and after became famous for speaking out against all forms of hatred. The enormity of the heartbreak uh, that rested within him was palpable. By, by the end of the Holocaust and into the coming decades, he used that anger and that heartbreak and despair to find strength. He found enormous strength, as far as I can tell, in rallying behind the atrocities he witnessed. And as a result, he brought the world closer together 
including my Dartmouth class, winning a Nobel Peace Prize in the process. And as I look around now, I see some threads that are similar. We're not experiencing as a result of this virus the sorts of atrocities that he did, but I cannot imagine that social distancing and the commonalities we are now feeling are not having some part in the massive uprising of individuals across the globe today, fighting for freedoms and equalities. It is not surprising to me that in all of the years of senseless deaths of young black men in America, it is now this week and these weeks that the world is rising up and saying enough is truly enough. I believe that this is linked to coronavirus and to a newfound dedication to society that comes from separation and anxiety and uncertainty. The global population has been removed from its normal standing over the last few months. All operations of daily social living have largely ceased. That commonality, that common experience of hardship and uncertainty, uncertainty must be playing some role. Instability and uncertainty are powerful tools for change. They pull people from the trajectory of routine life and offer a moment for reevaluation. I don't think I'm being too presumptive to assume that most of you have had some moments in the past couple of months to reevaluate and reflect on your goals and wishes. Eventually things will go back to normal, but I do not think everything will. We will have a renewed appreciation for our global society to figure out how to work together and recognize there are some things bigger than humans, and sometimes those can destroy us. It will force us to work together as a global community to fight epidemics into the future. And just like we're seeing with social distancing leading to the rising up of people around the world saying enough is enough, I think we will also see humanity find a new ability to work together and live as one. In our separation and uncertainty, we are undoubtedly coming together in a profound way. While I can't say for sure what any of you is going to do in the coming months and certainly not in the coming years, I can give an example from my own experience of how hardship can endure and build into something more positive. Today, I have a lab at Harvard where I am admittedly working to try to change the world through public health and understanding immunity to infectious diseases, including this particular coronavirus. My course started while I was at Dartmouth in part through tragedy. I was at Dartmouth when I moved to Sri Lanka where in a much longer story than I have time to tell here, I ordained as a Buddhist monk. While meditating in Sri Lanka, the Indian Ocean in tsunami hit. In a few hours, the tsunami killed over a quarter of a million people in Southeast Asia and over 40,000 people on the small, small island of Sri Lanka alone. The country's lifeblood, its shorelines and communities were erased. And I found myself in a position of complete uncertainty, trying to understand what to do, a young American Buddhist monk in the mountains of Sri Lanka, looking at death and destruction, isolated literally both physically and socially. That destruction and tragedy created a period of immense uncertainty for everyone including myself. For me, those pains and confusion helped focus my actions. Not so long afterwards, the experience provided me a clearer vision and fueled my desire to charge ahead. The enormity of the tragedy and the enormity of the change has propelled me in much of what I've done since. That experience taught me that it's okay and many times essential to get out of the routine and out of the common paradigms and that it's okay to make bold pivots even when they may seem to others to be outlandish. I know that I've been told my ideas are too outlandish on far too many occasions to count. But had I not chosen to become a monk, move to a refugee camp in the aftermath of the tsunami, or to build a nonprofit as a medical student, I don't think I'd likely be sitting here today with the sorts of experiences that have built my career. The uncertainty the world faces today is certainly profound. No one on earth knows what will happen with this virus in the months and years ahead. We can build mathematical models and experiments, but not one of the best epidemiologists in the world can tell you today for sure what's going to happen just this fall. Personally, I am extraordinarily concerned about what this virus might do to us in September and October, and by extension, what it might mean for everyone's ability to re return to routine existence. 
At our center at the Harvard School of Public Health, many of us are serving as advisors to world and local leaders to help navigate this pandemic. But the truth is we can only provide educated guesses. We too are handcuffed to the unknowns of the future. But in that fog, we're also charging ahead. We're seizing this moment not only to try to deal with this virus, but leveraging the collective interests surrounding the virus to try to make change across the scientific ecosystem or infectious diseases into something better and more enduring for public health. As far as I know of history, and I'm certainly no historian, it's always the times of great uncertainty and instability where the most meaningful changes have been made. I can't say for certain whether your job is going to take you this fall or your grad school will allow you to enter campus. But what I can say is that today is an opportunity to seize change. Whether that's change across the globe, as we're seeing with the protests on the streets surrounding George Floyd, or change within your own life, perhaps deciding you don't actually want to go to grad school or take that internship. For me, I changed my course. I was on an engineering path and my experiences in Sri Lanka caused me to pivot and choose to get a PhD in infectious diseases and go to medical school instead. Today, I certainly use all three disciplines daily. The uncertainty of today is an opportunity to rethink your plans and shape your own future in a way less reflective of what society might say is correct and more reflective of what is in line with your own heart. For many of you, you're already on that path. This is no referendum or judgment on what that means to you. What it is, is permission to take a moment to consider the paths before you and reflect on whether the one you're heading down is right for you now. The most impactful people that I know are those who have made each and every of their decisions based on what was most important to them at every juncture. By virtue of taking your next steps out of the college at this moment in time means that you're stepping out into an unknown future. I urge you to seize this opportunity. The silver lining of this pandemic and of George Floyd's senseless death is that these events have exposed the dire need for change. Who better to make that change than all of you? I wish you all the best in your next steps and beyond, and do hope that as a class, you find the opportunity for a proper commencement ceremony on the green sometime in the future. Good luck. I survived it. So remember, in these challenging times, you will survive it. Listen.
Thank you, y'all. Thank you, guys. Thank you. I picked up a film camera for the first time sophomore year, and during my time at Dartmouth, practicing looking through a lens has changed me in ways I could not have imagined. A year ago, I had a photo project where I asked my subjects, what is home for you? The answer widely varied. Some people talked about their childhood home, some people wrote about a memory, and some didn't really know. But reflecting on these interviews, I gathered that home is not just about a feeling or about being stuck in one place. In fact, and stay with me, I believe home may not really exist. Keeping this in mind, I want to share with you a verse from the Quran. Siru fil ardi faunduru. It says, go about the earth and look. This line comes from Surah al-Ankabut, or chapter titled The Spider, a small, minute creature that explores and creates a web from silk five times the strength of steel and much bigger than themselves. Like the spider, we can create our web to span different people, places, and experiences. It'll help us understand that our differences do not divide us but make us unique, and that our similarities show us that we express joy, sadness, love, and grief for largely the same reasons. Now, a spider produces its silk not out of materials in nature, but out of proteins from within itself. In that sense, our web is an extension of ourselves connecting us to everything. But when we face hardship, such as the challenges we're facing right now, when our web is swept away, each strand may not be very strong, but as we continue building and strengthening our web, rebuilding, improvising, and adapting becomes that much easier, and we'll see that our web is not the only one that exists. There's so much to learn and so much to see out there. In fact, this is the time to keep going, keep exploring, and keep looking and learning. Remember how I suggested that home might not exist at all? I believe, and to quote architect Neri Oxman, you have to go away to come back home. We never really truly have a sense of home until we leave home. But I know that to be the spider doesn't mean we have to travel thousands of miles to look at something in a different way. So yes, indeed, go about the earth and look. Widen your web. View all that life has to offer beyond home with an open heart to those you meet, an open mind to things you learn, and perhaps most importantly, open eyes to the things you may not see on first glance. Because only then can we come back home. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace. May the Lord God bless you all with hearts that are not six feet apart. Blessings to you. 4년 동안 수고했어요. 네 신고로. We are so proud of you. May you find peace in throwing yourself completely into the mess and beauty beyond Dartmouth. Baruch atah bevoecha, uvaruch atah v'tzetecha. Blessed are you in coming in, and blessed are you in going forth. Thank you.